Hello. Um, this is the weekly video blog. Uh, excuse the hair. Um, you'll find out in a moment why I'm looking a little less pristine than normal. So the two things that I want to talk about today mostly are um, Lorraine's funeral and the 100k bike ride that I was signed up to do with Cycle World for Women's Ride Month. Now, <clears throat> give you a wee pricey who Lorraine is. I, um, you, as you know, was in hospital millions of times before I actually lost my leg. And the very last time they admitted me to hospital before they made the decision, we, I, whoever, made the decision to amputate, was the time they tried to do the angiogram and it failed. And the graft went down as a result of an infection. That was the last time. So, I was on the ward and I was expecting this to be the next step and the ward has got rooms of four beds and each one the curtain pulls around now of course this is this magic curtain is not quite so magic because it's not soundproof or anything else and I knew what was going to happen I knew what they were what they were coming to tell me but the other people on the ward did not and so they came in to say there was nothing else they could do you know they'd have got a choice to keep the, the leg badly functioning or um, amputate the leg below the knee and I had to make the call which one I was going to do and I had to think about it. When they pulled back the curtain, Lorraine was um, the lady in the bed opposite and she was like and couldn't believe what she'd just heard. Of course, she was not expecting it. Now, we just like kind of got chatting from there onwards. Um, we were both in hospital this, you know, for a day or so, a day or two, not so long. And then I exchanged numbers with her daughter, I think, to stay in contact to find out how Lorraine would get on. And away I went. And I thought it was just a simple operation she was in for. Um, I managed to stay in contact with Lorraine uh, the whole time. I got hold of her number through her daughter and I would call her and ask her how she was. And um, each time I went up to Dunedin for limb centre appointments, which earlier in the year, and the end of last year, was very frequent, I would contact her and see how she was and take her out for lunch. Now, I didn't realise until, I think it was early on in this process, that Lorraine was actually suffering from leukaemia and had already survived one bout of cancer. And she was going to get regular blood transfusions. She was um, did not want to tell me this, so she asked her daughter to tell me this. Um, that didn't bother me. I still would take her out for lunch and, you know, whatever. And she said, no, you know, sometimes I'll have down days. I said, that's all right. I've got a wheelchair. And Lorraine actually got to ride my rental wheelchair that I got um, before they, whilst they were making my actual wheelchair. She got to go for a ride in it before I did. So um, it was brand new wheelchair to me, the, you know, the upgraded rental. And I pushed her to the coffee shop in my wheelchair. And so we had a laugh about that. Um, and I've done that a few times uh, over the last year, you know, got, when she's filling up to it, I've gone in, gone, picked her up, take her around, out for lunch, whatever. And Lorraine really loved that. Now, I didn't really, I really didn't think it was much I was doing, um, really literally only, you know, getting her out for lunch. Um, but actually what I found out in retrospect is that she had been battling cancer for a wee while and had been going through all of the chemotherapy and radiotherapy, which had make, been making her feel very ill because she felt like she had to for the benefit of all of her family, you know, in the, you know, so that to keep her around for them. And there'd been this little argument going on about, you know, no, she didn't need to. She needs to do what she wants to do. So Lorraine decided to stop doing the chemo because she didn't want to always be sick. Whatever time she had left, she wanted to enjoy it. So when we went out for lunch, she would get dressed up, put put a, put some jewellery on, put some lipstick on, and she loved it. This is before we had to all wear masks and all that malarkey. Anyway, she um, was then, she was well, well for a while and then took a sudden downturn really quite quickly. And it was a while and I couldn't get a hold of her. And um, she was, oh, call, when I was calling, she was saying she wasn't really up for it. Um, then I managed to find out from one of her daughters that had not been able to get a hold of her on the phone for a little while, got a hold of the rest of her family that I knew of, asked was she okay, and she was in hospital. She'd taken a downturn. The home help they were sending her was now not sufficient, 
and they were considering moving her to palliative care. And I was like, hells, bells. And it had been so quick. Uh, so I asked what, where I, my next limb centre appointment was on the 18th of October. I asked where would she would be that point. And she was in the hospital and she was being transferred to a rest home where they were going to treat her, um, you know, palliative care. And that was the transfer day, was the day that I was going to the limb centre. So I'm denied about whether I should or shouldn't, you know, transfer day is usually pretty exhausting for a patient who's pretty unwell. Um, and I'm denied and one of her daughters said, no, 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 she'd really want to see you. So I thought, oh, all right then, I'll give it a go. So after the limb centre, I went round, she'd not been there long. Um, now she was lying down, she looked more tired and um, a lot, had a lot less energy than normal, but she was still smiling. She was still telling me her stories of her younger years <clears throat> and what it was like to be uh, a pregnant mum in the 40s and 50s and all them sorts of things. Um, I loved her stories. They were just fabulous. I loved sitting and listening to her stories of her younger years. Anyway, she, she, you know, her, her oral faculties were still there, but she looked tired, more tired. Anyway, I got an, um, I went to Tianao for the weekend, for Labour Weekend, and I've got a message from her daughter that weekend that she had died, and I was just absolutely stunned because I'd seen her just six days before, and I was planning to come up to Dunedin this weekend, this is where I am right now, and I was going to visit her again, and so I was just like, so her funeral was this week. And I came up for it, um, asked the family, would it be okay? Now, I don't think that I did too much, really, in the grand scheme of Lorraine's life. I was only around for the last year of it, and I would take her out for lunch a few times. I didn't think it was too much of a big deal. She was a pleasant person to have around, and I quite liked her. And, um, and anyway, she, her life story was told in the funeral by the person taking the service, and... Um, they were telling her about, about when she was 17 and her husband was in the US Navy and had come over on a Navy ship and fell in love, got married. She went back to the US with him and followed him around his, with his Navy career and then finally came back at, when he retired from the Navy back to New Zealand. And it was like, a, a, you know, a romance story you might hear on the, um, you might see a video, a film of, you know. Um, and then uh, anyway, it progressed on through there. And this, her life story finished with having met me in hospital and her special friend, Mel. And I thought, and I honestly was not expecting to even get a mention, you know. And she's in such a small part of her life. Um, but all of her family knew who I was. I'd never, I'd only met her two daughters and her husband once. Um, and they all, she talked to them all about me and about all, what I'd done for her and stuff like this. And, oh, it, it, it was heartbreaking. It was really heartbreaking to sit through that funeral um, and listen to some, such a beautiful soul having been stolen from this earth. And it just sent me right back to when my mum died and having to sit through her funeral. And, and my heart was breaking for them because I, I knew what they were feeling um, but the fact that the uh, lunches were so special to Lorraine that it, that she wanted it mentioned in her funeral because she had planned this funeral prior to her, her death um, just blew me away, really. And, and the takeaway from that really is you seriously do not know what massive impact a tiny little gesture might be on have on someone's life you and I had no idea that they had become so important I was just doing something because just because not for any reason and she was a nice friend to have around and I like to listen to her stories and that's literally it I wasn't doing it for any other reason and it became such a massive important part of her life just be kind to people little small gestures it doesn't take much and it doesn't even take much thought and often not much effort but you have no idea what a massive impact that might have on someone's life so rest in peace Lorraine and it was a pleasure knowing you the second thing I want to talk about is the 100k ride that um, I was down to do. Now I'll tell you the background for that. So I 
was doing making we were making trial bike legs me and Ryoji the prosthetist and um I wanted to know if they could change the geometry of my bike and retool fit my Cervelo that I had to fit a prosthetic leg knowing that a prosthetic leg doesn't bend your leg doesn't and the same because of the restrictions of the socket. So that's what we were wondering, whether I'd still be able to get into that tight tuck position with a prosthetic leg. Went to the bike shop, turns out no, had to buy a new bike. And that's the short story. But I took three months before I could actually ride this outside. I tagged, a, took a picture and, and a GoPro video, I think, and tagged the bike shop in on it, saying thank you for getting me back out on the road. They asked me to come and speak at their Women's Ride Month, which was this month, October. And that was back in June when I bought the bike. So I said, yeah, OK, I don't mind. And I was talk I told them my story uh, at, and that sort of thing. There was four speakers. I was the only road ra uh, cyclist. And I noticed their last event of the Women's Ride Month was a 100k bike ride. Now, I've not only done one once in my life and I had two feet. And I said to the audience, is there anybody here that um, has never done a 100k bike ride? A few hands went up. Anybody here that's never done a 100k bike ride? Uh, feels slightly terrified about it, um, but think it, thinks it, you know, it might be possible. And, if, and it's still, there was still a couple of hands up. And I said, right, well, if any of you enter this before the end of tonight, I will. And three people did. So I'm like, oh God, I'm going to have to do it now. And so I... Um, haven't really done anything different to the training I've been doing with my cycling because I'm having so much trouble with it. Same amount of trouble on a different scale to walking. I am knocking four and five minutes off my um, 5k PB in a wheelchair every couple of weeks. It's just coming down in droves. The cycling I just am really struggling with and it doesn't seem to be changing much. And I'm trying to find a solution. And I regretted actually saying that and saying that I was going to do the 100k run bike ride. And I really didn't know if it would even be feasible. I had not really looked at the route they were doing. And Dunedin is surrounded by big hills. And so I didn't even know if I'd get up the hill to get out of there. I didn't know what type of people were doing this bike ride, whether they're beginners or normal cyclists. Normal cyclists, you know, or what? But I thought, well, I need to at least be standing there at the start and give it a go. So I did. And you know what? The three people that uh, challenged me to it weren't there. Go figure. So here is what happened. <laughs>
turns out the cyclists were pretty proficient cyclists. And when he did his little introduction, he said they were going to do an average of 25 kilometers an hour. And I thought, holy mother of Jesus, I do not know how I'm going to manage that. My average is sort of 17 or 18 and that's going, that's going good for me. And it, because of the claudication pain, the limits to the muscle because it doesn't get oxygen. So I thought, oh God. And before we'd even got out of Mosgiel, they'd, I'd lost them. I was struggling so much to hang on to them that if I'd carried on trying, I was just gonna bonk further down the road and I'd end up lying in the gutter and they'd have to bring me back. I knew I couldn't stay with them. And I was slowly dropping off and dropping off and dropping off. And I, did, I, I was just getting more and more irate, more and more upset with myself. Um, the fact that I couldn't keep with them, that I really wanted to, and this was something I had wanted to be successful at and I couldn't, and I felt like a failure. And I was getting so worked up. Um, there was two guys, that, there was four or five people that were cycling around the group, keeping, making sure everybody was safe, and a car following. And uh, one of the guys said, um, that we're gonna pull over here. They'd obviously been talking and making a plan. We're gonna pull over over here. And they stopped me in, in somebody's driveway. They told the group ahead that we'd stopped. And they said, look, how about this for an idea? You borrow my e-bike. And I've I've asked the van to go back and get my normal bike. And I, and I just burst into tears because I felt like, felt like it had been a failure. I felt like I had not done what I'd set out to do. And I really wanted to. And I didn't want to say that I'd not been able to. But I knew that I couldn't carry on. And it was this or go back and say I couldn't do it. And right there on the side of the road in Mosgill this morning, I had to face the fact again, and I have to face this fact a lot, that something I wanted to do, I cannot because of the limitations of my disability. And having to face that and make a decision about it right there and then was really tough. I had to do that with regards to the wheelchair. But I got my head around it in my quiet own little time and mooched around the park and did my own little thing. It was never a public problem. I did it privately. This was suddenly became a public decision based on my uh, disability. And that's what really, really destroyed me. But I knew, I knew it was the only way we were gonna be able to do it. So I borrowed his e-bike and he rode his normal bike. Now the e-bike, looks like a, a normal road bike but its down tube is slightly bigger and one of the bottle cages has got something that looks like a tool kit or bottle in it but it's actually the battery uh, and this was going to be the only way so they he told me how to use it it's got various levels of assist and told me to whack it up to the max get pedaling because we needed to catch the rest of the group and we'd stopped been stopped for a long time now this took me a long time to get used to the, the whole thing um, and I just want to stop here and say this this uh, this is how I expected um, electric bikes to be but this is not how they are. Now it's not a bike where you freewheel going up the hill and everything is like effortless and what is the point of having pedals it's not like that at all well this bike wasn't anyway um, so I felt like I'd been given a few extra watts. Uh, if you know anything about Zwift, it's like cheating with your weight so that everything's slightly easier. So it felt slightly easier to pedal at the speed that I was needing to pedal at to keep up with them. But I was still having to pedal. It's not like I was not pedaling. I was having to pedal. And I have to pedal in a certain cadence. Otherwise, the electric assist turns itself off. And so I was really struggling with this as well and how the heck that worked and then the gear changes aren't but on both sides like a normal road bike they're on one side and so it took me a long time to figure out how to down change on this bike and then of course you've got the handlebars i've got um tri bars over my handlebars which makes the handling of the front of the bike very different um and so i had to get used to that as well anyway we with all of this and the electric assist we managed to catch up with the group at Outram and I carried on with them from there but it's still really bloody hard but what I did notice and this is only because Katie asked me halfway along how was my leg because the force 
through the socket on the left wasn't having to be as big because there was a part power assist there was not so much force i was able to get 45 kilometers down the road before that calf started hurting 45 kilometers down the road um now my knee replacement was really not happy this evening and oh my god my legs and i'm so tired i've laid on the bed for four four or five hours uh, it took me three hours to muster up the energy to do to wash my uh, go and have a shower and another two to make the tea. Um, so this is not like a little picnic, people. It's not a bike that you just sit there and go hee and then you know motor along. I know there are like some like that because I've got an older friend who's got one. This was not that, but what it did do is it helped me get back um, some of what I've lost in the disability and be able to keep with the group. And you know what? Suddenly having to use an e-bike which i always thought was a failure i did not consider it to be a failure today because it was enabling me to get back what i lost that i might never get back because of the permanent um loss of function to this left leg so i have to say that i was quite surprised at how much i enjoyed it um, I did manage the 100k. Uh, I I was hysterical on the side of the road when Ray told me that, that this was the plan, um, and you, uh, yeah, and Tom Tom gave me a hug and they said, right, come on, we're going to get you there. And I was only 12k down the road and I didn't know how the hell this was going to happen. So I did the 100k. I needed an electric assist bike. I have an amputation. There are other people that use electric cyst bikes for other reasons. There was a girl that had one that was different, that she was able to go up hills without pedaling too much. So I'm sure there's different types of bikes that have different types of um, electric assist, but this one um, seemed to be based on rotation. And I was turning it down sometimes and it wasn't always on 100% um, maximum assist. And even then you don't freewheel along. You do come to a grinding halt. It's just the power going through. There is slightly more power than there is in your leg. So how power works with wattage in bikes is power to weight ratio. Um, so how much power you can put through per kilo that you weigh. And on um, Zwift, it reckons that I'm about... 122 watts per kilo some people are able to push out three four hundred watts per kilo i don't know if i'll ever be able to do that with this loss of function i don't want to have to use a hand bike i want to find a way to make a bike with two wheels and two legs work and this might have to be the way even if it's just for now because i can see the benefits of been doing long bike rides that i just can't do now because of the functional limitations to get my cardio fitness back up so unfortunately though electric bikes this type of e-bike is 10 grand as i asked so that is what happened with the ride today lots to learn and lots to think about lots to deal with at the same time uh yeah so i'm gonna go and lie down and drink coffee or maybe i think i've got one more beer left uh yeah and recover from that and t uh, take away some takeaways from it i rode 100k and some people haven't even done that even on an e-bike it was um i was able to get started up on um, when we were required to hop on and get across the road quickly we had to cross state highway one twice six one i don't know major state highway we had to cross it twice and both times I was able to get across it better than I thought, to be fair, considering my starting isn't super fast. But I was doing it better than another person who was on an e-bike who was getting off and pushing it across the road. So I'm winning for that, even though I've only got one leg. And when I got back, even though the three ladies that did not do the ride, were, that, did, that said they were going to do it and didn't turn up, even though they weren't there, there was another lady who rocked up just before we set off and said she was going to flake out and not come. But she saw my video last night and thought, oh, my God, you gotta, I've got to do it. So I don't give up. I don't give up on things easily. I don't like having to have choices forced on me and being pushed into a corner. That's what I didn't like about today. But I don't give up and I wasn't going to be going back unless I really had to. So thank you to Tom 
for and Ray for getting me back onto that bunch. They were riding in a group, shielding me from the wind, doing a chain gang, riding ahead at the junctions to stop the traffic so I didn't have to stop, so I could keep on going so we could get back to the group. So a massive thank you to those two guys, to Cycle World and all of the ladies for their support today. It has been hard and it's also been awesome.